All right, we are nine days in to the new year, into 2022, and at the beginning of the year, it's not uncommon for businesses, churches, nonprofit organizations to come up with their priorities or initiatives for the next 12 months or a span of time within that year. And whether they make them public or not, these priorities are meant to drive what they do, right? It allows for everyone in the organization to get fully aligned and unified about what's going on. Everybody can row in the same direction. It gives everybody something to work toward and focus on. And for some organizations, these priorities become a, a rally cry of sorts, and perhaps you've been a part of an organization that is in the practice of identifying their top priorities. And, and maybe you've even had the opportunity to give input on determining what those priorities should be. Or you've been a part of an organization and the senior leader or his team comes up with those initiatives for the new year and then they disseminate that information to the rest of the organization. But no matter how those priorities are chosen, if you've been a part of an organization like that, then you can attest to the value that comes from having clarity around the vision, direction, priorities, initiatives, whatever word you want to throw in, of your organization, because no one is left wondering, what's the plan? Where are we going? What am I supposed to be doing? And the organizations that stick to it and stay focused on their priorities, it generally pays off. They're able to accomplish a lot and move the needle when it comes to what matters most to them. Now, I would also guess and assume that there are a number of you who work for organizations that don't make their priorities known. In fact, you might even wonder if the leadership even knows what the word priorities mean, let alone identify them for everybody else, right? And generally, this leads to chaos and frustration because no one really knows what's happening. No one really knows where they're going or what they're supposed to be doing. There's no unity, no alignment, no clarity, no focus. These organizations follow the mantra, ready, shoot, aim. And if you found yourself in an organization like this over an extended period of time, you can't help but think, I've got to get out of here, right? I have to find a new job. Of course, identifying top priorities isn't just a good practice for nonprofits or other corporations. I think there can be value in doing this for individuals or even for family units as well. One church leader talks about the idea of a six by six, meaning you ask the question, what are the top six priorities or tasks that I will commit to doing in the next six weeks? And this particular leader found that when you limit the number of priorities and you limit the amount of time in which you're going to accomplish them, it can produce a high level of productivity and effectiveness when it comes to accomplishing your goals and initiatives. Now, if I were to give you five minutes and say, I want you to come up with your personal list of priorities and initiatives that you have for this year or the next six weeks, what have you, and we went to town on that list, I would imagine that our lists are going to be very different. Sure, we might have a few things in common, but the reality is that your life circumstances and my life circumstances are different. You might be in a different stage of life, have a different kind of job, and so what you're focused on is going to be different than what I'm focused on. And, and so our lists, lists are going to different, be different in, in a, probably a significant way. But when it comes to our shared faith and living out that faith, what should we focus on? As followers of Jesus, what should be our top priorities? And maybe you've never even really considered that question. And of course, there's many ways in which that we can answer that question. And certainly we don't have enough time to figure out or determine or answer all the ways in which people might say, this is the top priorities for followers of Jesus. But that being said, I want to use our time this morning to propose Four priorities that I believe are worth our focus, time, and attention as we try to live out our faith as Christ followers. And so, here we are. As followers of Jesus, one of our top priorities is to introduce people 
to Jesus. And it's hard to deny that this ought to be a priority of Christians because of Jesus' words in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this passage is known as the Great Commission. And it's our command, it's our calling as followers of Jesus to make more disciples or followers of Jesus. We're to make more disciples. And of course, it's hard to be a disciple of Jesus without knowing Jesus. And therefore, it's vital that you and I introduce people to Jesus. Now, if you've been a follower of Jesus probably for any length of time, this fact that it, this, or this priority, it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that this would rank at the top for us as followers of Christ. I mean, this is something that most churches will mention on a regular basis. But knowing that introducing people to Jesus ought to be one of our top priorities and knowing how to introduce people to Jesus are two different things. Allow me to illustrate when I am standing on the golf course in the tee box with my ball on a tee, driver in hand, I know that I should hit my ball down the middle of the fairway. That's my top priority. But knowing that I should hit the ball down the middle of the fairway and actually knowing how to hit the ball down the middle of the fairway are two different things. Now, not to brag, but when I do tee off, I generally do land in the fairway just not on the hole that I'm playing on, right? (laughs) Perhaps some of you share my frustrations and my plight. So this question, well, how is it then? How is it that we introduce people to Jesus? What do we need to know or do in order to accomplish this particular priority? Well, see, it's pretty simple. It all begins with building relationships with people who don't yet know Jesus. And I'm sure you're all blown away by the depth and complexity of this contest, uh, t- concept. Excuse me. You see, you're not going to be very effective when it comes to introducing people to Jesus if all of the people that you know and spend time with already know Jesus, right? And like, hey, have you met Jesus again? Like, you're, you're not going to be all that effective when it comes to accomplishing this priority. And so if Jesus expects us to make disciples, to introduce other people to him, then it's only logical that he would expect us to spend time with those who don't yet know him. And that's exactly what Jesus did during his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, it says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, if we're going to introduce people to Jesus, then we have to follow Jesus' example And be intentional about building relationships with those who don't yet know Jesus. See, the people in your life who aren't yet Christians, they're not going to come to accept Christ just magically one day. They need people, followers of Christ, you, who are willing to intentionally invest in a relationship, who are willing to enter their world, just like Jesus did for us. Meaning if you don't know non-Christians or have a regular interaction with people who don't share your faith, that's a problem. We need to make ourselves available and begin investing relationally with non-Christians that God has already placed in our lives. Additionally, if we're going to introduce people to Jesus, then we have to be prepared to share the gospel, the good news with them. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 says, How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? You see, those who aren't yet Christians have to hear the gospel message so they have the opportunity to receive the gospel message. 
And so that means you and I need to be able to share the gospel clearly and concisely with them. We need to be able to tell them this is the message that is going to save you. You can't. He did. And because he did, you can. And we've talked about this before. Right? It's a simple gospel presentation. You can't. He did. Because he did, you can. You can't save yourself. Because of the sin in your life, you're separated from God, and there's nothing that you can do to earn or close that gap, to earn that relationship back. He did. He died on the cross for you. He did what you couldn't do for yourself. And because he did, you can because Jesus died for, uh, for us, you can be saved. You can have a restored relationship with God, and all you have to do is ask for his forgiveness, believe that he can save you, and commit to living your life for him. And so, if we're going to introduce people to Jesus, you can summarize it in these two simple words, invest and invite we need to invest relationally with those who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. And then we need to invite them to, into a personal relationship with him. Now, throughout this morning's message, I'm going to ask you to assess yourself honestly, right? Some honest evaluation. And the question is, would you be able to say that introducing people to Jesus is one of your top priorities in your life? And if so, that's great. And you need to figure out how to, to ensure that that remains a priority. And if not, you need to figure out what steps you're going to take so that this becomes a higher priority. All right, and so as followers of Jesus, another top priority that we need to have is to grow in our relationship with God. You see, as a father of four, my desire is to have a vibrant, healthy, dynamic relationship with all of my kids. And if you have kids, you probably feel the exact same way, right? I want to know them on an intimate level. I want to know what makes my kids tick. I want to know why they misbehave. I want to learn about their interests, their, their hopes, their fears, their dreams. And of course, this vibrant and healthy relationship that I desire to have with my kids isn't going to just happen on its own. It requires something of me. It requires me that I, to, for me to be present and engaged. It requires my time and energy. And since my kids are on the younger end of the spectrum, I'm the one doing the heavy lifting when it comes to fostering this healthy relationship with them. But as they get older, this healthy relationship that I desire for us to have, they're going to start, to, they will start to become a shared responsibility. They're going to have to start putting in some work, time, and energy as well for us to have this dynamic relationship. And I'm not too worried about it because friends of mine who already have teenagers have told me that their kids love to spend time with them, absolutely adore spending time with their parents. And so I, I'm not too worried about it, right? Like, I, it's probably good to go. You see, for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, the Bible says that we've been adopted by God and we've become his children. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says, In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, How great is the Father, excuse me, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. So in the same way that I want a, a loving and thriving relationship with my kids, God, our Heavenly Father, wants a dynamic and intimate relationship with us. And the beautiful thing is that God is always present, ready, and willing to engage. He loves us unconditionally, and he pursues us relentlessly. Meaning, if we want this intimate and dynamic and healthy relationship with God, he's always doing his part. And so we have to do ours. Well, that begs the question, what is our part? How do I have this dynamic and thriving relationship with God? How can I experience a deeper level of spiritual maturity and growth? Well, first, we have to understand that growing in our faith requires time and energy. 
You see, just like our relationship with God, and it's like any other relationship we have. It's not going to happen on its own. It's going to require that we are present. We must be engaged. And so when it comes to our relationship with God, one way that we can be present and engaged is to have a solid prayer life. You see, through prayer, we have access to God anytime we want, and we need to utilize it. In fact, the Apostle Paul encouraged us to utilize it all the time. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray continually. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to us because prayer is how we express ourselves to God. And what father doesn't want to hear from his children? Now, just a quick plug, a little commercial. For all of the women here in the audience and, and online, there is a gathering coming up called Coffee and Conversation. It's, it's hosted by our women's ministry. And from time to time, they'll host these events, and each one has a different topic. And this topic for this upcoming event is on prayer. And so if you want to invest some time and energy in, in growing in this aspect of your relationship with God, I would hurt, highly encourage you to jump on our website and get signed up for this upcoming event. Now, we can also do our part to develop a dynamic relationship with God by reading and studying his word. Because this is the primary way that God communicates with us. And so if we're not reading scripture and more importantly, growing in our understanding of it, it's unrealistic for us to expect that we're going to experience a greater level of spiritual maturity and growth. And just last Sunday, seven days ago, Pastor Noah was on this stage, and, and he gave us some tips and tools when it comes to studying the Bible. And so if you don't know how to do that, or if you could use a refresh, jump on our website and re-listen to his message and be equipped in how to study your Bible in an effort to grow in your relationship with God. And then last but not least, if we want to grow in our relationship with God, then we need to live in obedience to him. During Jesus' time on earth, he was always and only obedient to God. He lived in complete submission to the will of the Father. And if we want our relationship with God to thrive, then it's in our best interest that we submit to his will as well. Time for another self-assessment, right? That, that evaluative question. Based on the time and energy that you spend in prayer, reading and studying God's word and striving to live in obedience, would you be able to say that growing in your relationship with God is a top priority in your life right now? You see, for those of you who are looking to take a practical step when it comes to growing in that relationship, then I would encourage you, I would recommend that you join a rooted group. We just talked about during the announcements. It's an opportunity for you to get rooted in your faith. LifePoint.org slash groups. Make it happen. All right. Another top priority for us as followers of Jesus is that we need to connect with other believers. We got to connect with other believers. Meaning we need to be in a community of faith where we can be encouraged, cared for, counseled, corrected, and challenged by other Christians. You see, connecting with other believers has been an important aspect of the church since its inception. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Acts 2.44 says all the believers were together and had everything in common. Acts uh, 2 verse 46 says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Certainly there are things that we do differently when it comes to church today compared to the early church in the book of Acts. However, the importance of community remains. That hasn't changed one bit. Here's what we got to understand. When the church, the people, gather together, we can experience everything that God intends for the church to be. And this is why the author of Hebrews writes this, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I am so grateful 
for the fact that we have online services. And I'm grateful for the men and the women who have the knowledge and skill set to make that happen for us and provide a quality experience online each and every Sunday. Online services have allowed those who are sick or in a high-risk category, those who care for someone who's high-risk, and, and those who work in a field with high exposure, even those who might be traveling, to stay in tune with what's going on at LifePoint. However, I know there are also people watching online because it's convenient. And I get it. You can go to church and not wear pants. I understand the appeal, right? Don't know that I could get away with that on stage. So I understand the appeal. Really do. But if convenience is the primary reason you're attending online, then it's time to come to church. It's time to come to church. Similarly, if you're attending exclusively online or more often than not, and you can sip a latte at a coffee shop, or you can go out to eat at a restaurant, then you have to ask yourself the question, why am I not going to church? You are robbing yourself. You are robbing yourself of opportunities for God and you to experience the church he intends for us to experience. You're robbing yourself of opportunities for your brothers and sisters in Christ to minister to you. And not only that, you're robbing everybody else of opportunities for you to minister to your brothers and sisters in Christ. See, I don't want you to miss out on the fellowship and the ministry of the church that takes place when the cameras aren't recording. And if we understand, truly understand, the power that takes place when God's people are together, ooh, we wouldn't miss. We'd be doing everything we can to be here. And I know there are plenty of legitimate reasons for people to attend online. For some people, it is their only option. And praise God for the technology and the people that make it possible. But if we have the ability to be here, we need to do everything we can to make it happen. Connecting with other believers should also be a priority because here's the thing. Isolation is dangerous to our spiritual health. You see, Satan loves Lone Ranger Christians. He loves it. Because like a lion, he separates us from the pack and he picks us off. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Knowing that, we got to be doing everything we can to avoid isolation. Doing everything we can to be in community with other Christians. Solomon talks about the value of connecting with others. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 12 says this, Two are better than one, because they make a good return for their work. If one falls down and his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not Quickly broken. Got to ask yourself the question. Would you say that connecting with other believers is a priority in your life right now? And if, if not, make some changes so you're not living in isolation. And one of the practical steps you can do to connect with others is to join a life group. Lifepoint.org slash groups. You have time. They haven't even started yet. Make that a priority. 
Another of our top priorities as followers of Christ ought to be serving others. You see, if I'm being honest, I'm pretty good at being selfish, especially when it comes with my time. I need very little practice. It comes naturally. No training required. I am good at being selfish. And of course, that's not what God desires. He wants us to be selfless. He wants us to serve others. And Jesus makes this abundantly clear in a conversation that he was having with his disciples. In Mark chapter 10, verses 43 and 45, it says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul communicates a similar message to us in Philippians chapter 2. In verses 3 through 8, he writes, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or in vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus gave his life away in service to others. And we see that time and time again throughout the Gospels. He gave his time to people willingly. He willingly met people's needs. And then he willingly gave his life for us by dying on the cross. Just prior to his death in John chapter 13, following the Passover meal with the disciples, Jesus gets up from the table and begins to wash the disciples' feet, a task that certainly would have been beneath someone of Jesus' stature. However, Jesus sets an, an example for his disciples and for us by serving them in this way. John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15 says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You see, we're called to serve others. And it doesn't matter where, whether that's the community, church, home, and it doesn't matter who, family, friends, strangers. Our calling remains the same. And so if you were to conduct a self-assessment, would you find that serving others is a priority in your life? Like Jesus, are you in the habit of giving your life away? We know the importance of serving others, and we know how much it can positively impact our spiritual growth. That's why we encourage everyone at LifePoint to go to one and serve one. Meaning, go to a service, attend a service, and serve during another service. And I know there are so many of us at church who do just that. And I know there are so many others who serve consistently in the community. But in case you're looking to make this serving others a higher priority in your life, allow me to just give you some ideas of ways that you can serve others through various ministries at LifePoint. See, as I mentioned earlier, you can meet a tangible need by simply picking up groceries. You don't even have to go into the grocery store area of Raley's. It's easy. You pick them up, put them in your car, you drop them off at New Hope so that 50,000 people can eat. Just one way. You can ensure that everybody who comes through our doors on a Sunday morning has a great experience at church by joining one of our guest service teams. If you do exclusively attend online, for whatever reason, that's where you have to be these days. We're looking for your help to serve as an online service host. We've been trying to build that team for six months, and you could serve in a significant way by helping us facilitate that service for those who have to attend online. And of course, that's not the only way you can serve at LifePoint. If you go on our website, super low pressure environment, go to lifepoint.org slash serve. You can click on a button that says sign up to serve and browse a bunch of the different ways and ministries where you can get involved and invested in serving others through LifePoint. And once you complete that form, our team would be happy to follow up with you and help you get plugged in. Here's what we know. 
There are so many things that compete for our time and attention, right? Every single day we're pulled in different directions, whether it's work, kids, stuff that just doesn't matter. It still sinks its claws into us and grabs on. But man, if we, the church, can prioritize the things of God, the things that matter, introducing people to Jesus, growing in my relationship with him, connecting with other believers because I know I need it, and serving others, man, God will be glorified. And he's going to use us to expand his kingdom here in Oak Grove. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. We got to be engaged. It's time to get to work. The reality, the season of life that we're in, it's not going to change. This is going to be here for a while. So it's time for the church to be the church. Figure it out, move ahead, reach people, connect with others, serve people. Because if we're not doing it, who will? Who's going to? The world is watching us to make a difference. This is our opportunity. We have to grab hold of it. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. Let's pray. God, I'm, I'm grateful for your word. I'm grateful for the challenge that it brings. I'm grateful that, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we could even think about these things. How you want us to spend our lives. God, we are pulled in so many different ways. But you've made it clear what you want from us. And it's not easy, but we have a direction. We know what we're supposed to be doing. You've given us our priorities. God, help us. Help us to live them out. God, for, prevent us from being pulled into things that just simply don't matter so we can make an impact for you and your kingdom here, for your glory alone. Amen.